The first level cache is used in all of your applications and a lot of developers don't even know about it. The good thing is, you most often also don't need to know or care about it. Hibernate does everything on its own and uses the first level cache internally to optimize the communication with the database. The first level cache is activated by default and Hibernate stores all entities in it, which were used within a session. This provides two main benefits. It avoids additional database round trips if you want to get an entity from the entity manager that was already used within this session. And Hibernate tries to delay write operations as long as possible and therefore also puts the changed entities into the first level cache. Each session has its own cache and cannot see the entities from the other Hibernate sessions. As you will see in the demo, all these things are hidden by the Entity Manager API so that it is easy to forget that the first level cache is involved in several operations. But that has also the disadvantage that it is not that obvious if an operation uses the first level cache or not. Hibernate uses the cache only if you use the find method on the Entity Manager or if you traverse defined relationships to other entities but not if you use a JPQL, native, or criteria query. Let's get into the IDE and try it out. You can find the examples for this module in the project called First Level Cache. And there you can find the test First Level Cache class in which I prepared a set of test cases to show you how to use the First Level Cache and when Hibernate will not use it. Let's begin with the method testEMFind. As you can see, this one is quite simple. I create the Entity Manager and start the transaction. And then I iterate twice through this loop to get the author with ID 1, print out his name and then iterate through his books and print them out. So what do you think? How many queries will Hibernate perform to print this author and his books twice? Let's run this test and have a look at the log. Okay, you can already see it here in the session matrix. Hibernate performed only two queries and you can see them up here. One to get the author and an additional one to get his books. Both calls were performed in the first iteration of the loop and added the author and book entities to the cache. And Hibernate got them from there in the second iteration. The next thing I want to show you is the isolation between different Hibernate sessions. I explained previously that each session has its own first level cache and cannot see the entities loaded by other sessions. I prepared the test two sessions test method for that. As you can see here, the test creates a session, starts the transaction and loads the author with ID 1. And then it does the same thing again, so that we now have two sessions which both loaded this author into its own first level cache. If we run this test, we should see two queries for this specific author and two session matrix in the log. And here you can see the two session matrix which both report one query. The two select statements for the author are up here. That means that each session has its own entity for this specific author and that they can change it independently of each other. Before you start worrying about concurrency issues, Hibernate supports different locking mechanisms to avoid lost update issues. I will get into more details about this in the concurrency chapter at the end of this course. You have seen that Hibernate used the first level cache automatically when we called the find method on the entity manager or accessed the relationship to other entities. That is very comfortable and we get some performance improvements for free. But you have to keep in mind that the first level cache is not used if you perform a query. Even not with a JPQA query which returns an entity. I prepared two test cases to show this. Let's start with the test JPQA query method. This test performs the same query twice within this loop and prints out the name of the author. The query is very simple and just gets the author entity by ID. You can see here in the log that Hibernate indeed performed two queries. 
as I said, the first level cache is only used if you call the find method or access a defined relationship. So make sure to use the find method if you just want to get an entity by ID. And if you use the fetch join to initialize related entities, you should replace it with an entity graph as I showed you in one of the previous videos. You can provide it as a hint to the entity manager to use it with the find method. Okay, the same thing happens, of course, if you use a constructor query instead of a query which selects an entity. I prepared this in the test constructor query method. You can see the constructor query here. It selects the properties of the author with ID 1 into the constructor of the author value, which is a simple pojo. And here are the two queries performed by Hibernate. That the first level cache isn't used in this case is quite obvious. It works only with entities and isn't used for queries. So there's no reason to use it here. As you have seen, in general, it is really easy to use the first level cache because you don't have to do anything. But as good as the first level cache is in most of the regular use cases, it can also become an issue in very huge transactions like batch imports. Keeping thousands or even hundreds of thousands of entities in the cache requires a lot of memory and management effort. As a result, the first level cache can slow down your application in these use cases. If that is the case, you need to remove entities from the cache programmatically. This can be done via the methods detach and clear of the entity manager. Detach removes a specific entity from the cache and clear removes all of them. The entity will be in detached state after it was removed from the first level cache. That saves some memory, but it also means that Hibernate will not write any changes on this entity to the database. So you better make sure that all changes are stored in the database before you detach the entity. This can be done by calling the flush method on the entity manager. I prepared some examples for the first level cache management in the test cache management class. Let's begin with the test first level cache detach method. As you can see here, I first used the entity manager find method to get the authors with ID 1 and 2 and the book with ID 1. Then the log cached objects method is called, which uses the contains method on the entity manager to check if these entities are managed and belong to the current persistence context. If that is the case, then these entities are also stored in the first level cache. Now the detach method is called with author1 and the log cached objects method gets called again. And in the final step, the clear method gets called to remove all entities from the cache. Okay, let's see what happens if we run this test case. Here you can see the three queries to get the authors with ID 1 and 2 and the book with ID 1 from the database. After that, you see the output from the log cached objects method, which tells us that all three entities are managed and stored in the first level cache. Then the author with ID 1 gets detached and we see in the output of the log cached objects method that it no longer belongs to the current persistence context, which means that it is no longer in the first level cache. Afterwards, all entities get cleared from the current persistence context and you can see the expected output. The last thing I want to show you is the issue that occurs if you detached a changed entity before it is written to the database. You can find this example in the test update after cache detach method in the test cache management class. I first get the entity from the database and change the first and the last name. The changed entity is now in the first level cache and when I call the find method again, I get the same entity with all the changes. We will see that in this log statement. Afterwards, I detach the entity, call the find method again and log the entity.
At first, Hibernate has to perform a query to get the author from the database and we get a managed entity which is stored in the first level cache. Here you can see the changed first and last name of the author before it is detached from the current persistence context. After the call of the detach method, the entity is no longer managed and Hibernate has to perform a query to get it from the database. There was no update statement before the entity got detached from the current persistence context and the database still returns the initial value for the first and last name. So we basically lost our changes. To avoid this, you have to tell Hibernate to send an update statement to the database. One way to do this is to call the flush method on the entity manager. As you can see here, the call of the flush method triggered an update statement. The changed first and last name are now written to the database and we can detach the entity without losing any changes. The select statement down here returns the changed first and last name. That's all about the first level cache for now. Let me summarize the most important things before we get into the exercises. The first level cache is activated by default and stores all entities which were used within a specific session. Hibernate hides the calls to the cache behind its API so that you don't need to take care of anything. Very huge sessions which work with a lot of entities might require to remove entities programmatically from the cache to reduce the memory footprint.